It was the day, the first Saturday, but also the day after the feast of St. Athanasius, here in St. Mary's. And we read here the epistle of the Mass for St. Athanasius, the bishop, taken from the Corinthians, St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians, chapter 4. In the second epistle of St. Paul's Corinthians, chapter 4. Brethren, we preach not ourselves, but Jesus Christ our Lord, and ourselves your servants through Jesus. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ Jesus. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency may be the, of, of the power of God and not of us. In all things we suffer tribulation, but are not distressed. We are straitened, but are not destitute. We suffer persecution, but are not forsaken. We are cast down, but we perish not. Always hearing, always bearing about in our body the mortification of Jesus, that the life also of Jesus may be manifest in our bodies. For we who live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake that the life also of Jesus may be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. But having the same spirit of faith, as it is written, I believe, for which cause I have spoken. We also believe, for which cause we speak also, knowing that he who raised up Jesus will raise up us also with Jesus in pl and place us with you. And the, and the gospel. St. Edward and St. Matthew, chapter 10. At that time, Jesus said to his disciples, When they shall persecute you in this city, fly to flee to another. And then I say to you, You shall not finish all the cities of Israel till the Son of Man come. And the disciple is not above the Master, nor the servant above his Lord. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his Master, and the servant as his Lord. If they have called the good man of the house Beelzebub, how much more them of his household? Therefore fear them not, for nothing is covered that shall not be revealed, nor hid that shall not be made known. That which I tell you in the dark, speak ye in the light, and that which ye hear in the ear, preach ye upon the housetops. And fear ye not them that kill the body, and are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him that can destroy both the soul and body, into hell. That's what the words of today's Holy Gospel. We call this and we will commend. So on this Holy First Saturday, it happens to be the Feast of St. Athanasius, the great warrior and defender of the Church in the Arian crisis, born in the year 292, lived in the 300s in the 4th century. And at that time, the church, the bishops of the church, did the same thing they're doing right now. They followed a wise priest named Arius. And Arius taught that Jesus Christ is not really God, but only a man. That he is true, and true and he, is, he is not true God, but only true man, with a lot of godlike and supernatural characteristics. And there are many, many different kinds of Arians, so many different types. There was a great dispute amongst the Arians. There were liberal Arians, and there were conservative Arians. Just like in the day of the church, there are liberal Novus Ordo people, and there are, are conservative Novus Ordo people. And so in the day, those days, the Arians, some of the Arians said Jesus Christ really is so much like a new God that there is no one like him. That he is so like a new God that we can truly even say that he is God, but God-like not exactly identical to God, but so similar to God that he is above all the angels, that he is truly great. And other Arians says, no, he's just an ordinary man. And they disputed, disputed amongst themselves in a great arguments and debates. And if you read the heretical document of Syria, you read it, if you read over it, it takes about what Jesus Christ is. And when you read over it, and glance over it very quickly, it doesn't sound like a complete denial. Nor does it sound like a clear denial that Jesus Christ is God. But when you look into what it really means, it is very clearly actually a true denial. But in very clever language, so that it doesn't seem like a very clear denial, 
that Jesus Christ is true God and, and not just true man. And he made it sound almost Catholic and almost Catholic. And many of those at the time of the Aryan crisis said, well, let's stop this fighting. Let's be at least against the liberal Aryans. And the movement of that time is very similar to what's happening right now in the church. There was a young deacon named Athanasius. And Athanasius it was very short of stature, he had black hair, slightly dark skin, and a red beard. And he was filled with fire. And they said when he walked around his prayers, he looked like he was an angel. But when he spoke, he spoke with great clarity, and he completely smashed the heretics, the very enemies of God. When he wrote the creed that is named after him, the Athanasian Creed, he recognized very clearly the seriousness of the Holy Creed. For it is impossible that a man be saved unless he believe the Catholic faith whole and entire. Therefore, without doubt, whoever does not hold the whole Catholic faith will without doubt perish. And this would cause the Arians to hate him from the very beginning and try to kill him multiple times. He had to flee from the, from the Arians, he was made eventually the Bishop of Alexandria, the Patriarch of Alexandria, but then he, had to, he, had, he, was, he was driven out by Pope Liberius three different times, and he had to flee five times from the, from the city, he was banished for, because of his Orthodox teaching. In other words, so many people forgot, began to play games of the faith, but he would not play it. He was one, of course, who made the very famous statement, they have the churches and we have the faith, and that we cannot give up our faith for the, for the sake of keeping our churches. And we can't play games of the truth of the faith because when you play games of the truth of the faith, what will happen? Our children will lose everything. And since what is, what is the strength of our holy church? And also he was, he was cursed, he was hated, he was despised. Pope Liberius writes in his condemnation of him, how I have nothing to do with Athanasius, I despise Athanasius, I want to go back and return to Rome. I want to go back home. He had said to the Arians, and in order to show how he was faithful to the Arians, he showed his hatred of Athanasius. But as time has progressed, we have forgotten about the man Athanasius, although he is a great saint of the church. But the faith that he preserved remains 2,000 years later, and the, or 1,700 years later. It remains because of his great strength in the faith. In every single age, the devil has attacked the faith. In every single age, he has attacked the truth. And that, there, and that there have been clever men who have tried to find a way to make friends between the enemies of God and the friends of God. Later on, 100 years, 150 years after Athanasius died, came the Monothelite heresy. And at that time, the Pope, the Pope Honorius said, We are fighting each other. We all believe that Jesus Christ always did God's will. We always believe Jesus Christ was always a good person. And he always obeyed God's will. So let us not worry about the heretics who say that he really had a human will, or the truth that is he really had a human will, and the heretics say he didn't have a human will. What difference does it make? Jesus always did what God wanted. And if he had a human will, fine, we know that he did. But the monothelites don't know he had a human will. And so they don't believe he had a human will. So it doesn't matter as long as we do the right thing. And he read those words 1,500 years ago. And then after him, St. Leo II became the Pope, and St. Leo II said, Honorius, the Pope, there was two Popes before him, is in hell. And Honorius is condemned. Because Honorius decided that behavior was more important than truth, and that you could have good behavior without truth. And now this has happened again in our Holy Church, that we believe you can have good behavior without truth. As long as you have the majority of the truth, it doesn't matter. But the truth is like a boat. Truth is exactly like a boat or like a balloon. Either the whole thing has no leaks or the whole thing sinks. If there is a hole in the side of a boat, it sinks. And one thing that happened with the boat of Noah is that God told Noah, pitch it on the inside and pitch it on the outside. Don't just make it waterproof on the outside, make it waterproof on the inside. And so he made it waterproof on both sides. And then eight days before the flood, God himself closed the door, and he made the final sealing of the door, because Noah could not do it himself, and therefore, the great tempest of 40 days of rain, and 40 days of, of, of the most torrential attack, the boat did not sink. 
And so likewise, when the Holy Mother Church goes up into the sea of the world, the sea equals passions, the sea equals sin, the sea equals death. There's all kinds of impurity, there's all kinds of violence, there's all kinds of pride, there's all kinds of greed, there's all kinds of the seven capital sins that are most increased in our times. How do you make sure the boat of the ship, the ship of the church survives it? You put pitch on the inside, and you put pitch on the outside, as Noah did. hundred years building that boat, and what was the main thing he did? He did build it of gopher wood, but what did he make sure? It was fully sealed, so that nothing that was on the outside, the water of heresy, could not pass into the inside. He protected it on the inside as well, so that there would be no, uh, no problem of the of the of death upon the inside either. He doubly protected it to show the absolute necessity of keeping the contagion of lies and the contagion of heresy outside of the church. Once a lie enters the church, one good example right now is the lie of the medicine world. The medical world tells you that vaccines are healthy. The medical world tells you the coronavirus is going to kill everybody and they are lying. What is the result of their lies? These are lies about health. The result of the lie about health is that millions are sick and millions are dying. And they are dying because lies spread more death, even in the physical realm, than does disease. The virus has to physically spread from one person to another. The plague has to physically spread, and eventually the plague runs out. But what about the lies? Concerning the health of vaccines, they're going to make more of them and more of them. It'll never end. And the lies about the virus, all they have to do is whenever a new cough comes, say that there's another virus. And these lies, what do they do? They guarantee death. They guarantee the destruction of health. Lies destroy more than anything else. Even the body is destroyed more by lies. What does a doctor do when he goes to school? He's supposed to learn about the various parts of the body. Doctor means teacher. He's supposed to learn about what is required for health. Then he is supposed to teach the sick people what they must do to be healthy. And what happens if he learns lives? It destroys the health of millions. What happens if he hands out poisons? It destroys the health of whatever ones he can contact, which is a very small number. But if he hands out lives, when that doctor dies, the lies continue and health is destroyed everywhere. St. Athanasius recognized the great enemy of our church is not bad behavior, is not immorality. We must combat immorality at every age. But the great enemy of our church is the water of lies that enters into the church. And if there is a small hole in the side of that boat, remember the ark, if it had the very smallest hole, the ark had to sit in the sea for more than a year. And no matter how small the hole, the water would have eventually filled the entirety of the ark and killed everyone on it. Both the eight human beings and all of the animals would all have died if it had only one hole. Therefore, the principal duty of Noah during those 100 years was to make sure that it had no hole. And this is the principal duty of the church. So what is happening in the world today? We are not following the example of Christ. And Christ mentions what is going to happen. At that time, Jesus said to his disciples, <clears throat> when he's talking to his 12 apostles, instructing them in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 10. It has a similar instruction in Luke chapter 10. At that time, Jesus said to his disciples, when they shall persecute in one city, flee to another. Athanasius had to flee to many cities when he was being persecuted, hence is chosen for his mass. And then flee to another. And then I say unto you, you shall not finish all the cities of Israel till the Son of Man come. Here is where Christ makes a prophecy. The servant is not greater than the master. He's going to explain why. You that men, all the servants of Israel shall not be evangelized till the Son of Man come. The disciple is not above the master, nor the servant above his Lord. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master and the servant as his Lord. If they have called the good man of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? So he's instructing his apostles. What did they call Jesus Christ? Well, we said thou art Beelzebub, thou, and, thou, thou, and thou, thou hast a devil. 
Well, that they said this, that thou, that thou, thou hast a devil. In other words, that I have not a devil. Well, I am not a devil, but they called him a devil. They said he has a devil. They called him Beelzebub. And our Lord said to his twelve apostles, They call me Beelzebub. They call me a devil. The servant is not greater than the master. If you go out in the world, you shall also be called devils. And this is the case of everyone that has stood for the faith down the last 2,000 years. And it will not change. It will not change. St. Peter Canisius, they tried to kill him multiple times in his fight against Protestantism. St. Joseph had killed in his fight against the Orthodox. And all the way through the ages, the hatred of those who preach the truth. St. Anthony Mary Claret, they tried to kill him five times for preaching the truth in the 19th century. And then every, and St. Uh, Arthur Lefebvre, they tried to kill him also once when he was traveling to South America. And they're worried about him trying to be killed as, at the time of the consecrations. But always attack and always hate it. The servant is not greater than the master. If you're going to go into the army, realize there's going to be bullets. Now what is the bullet that the priest must face? The young man goes to the seminary, he's going to study the word of God. And what does he tell them? What you hear in, this, in, the, uh, in, the, in the closet, preach you on the housetops. Does that mean he's supposed to be an investigative journalist? Does a priest an investigative journalist? One who goes in looking for all the wicked and bad people so he can preach on the housetops. This is today's sermon. We have an announcement about Mr. So-and-so and Mrs. So-and-so and this person and that person and how wicked that they are. What does our Lord Jesus Christ say? Well, you hear in the closet, you preach on the housetops. He explains it to them. He is preaching to them in private right now. Therefore, fear them not, for nothing... No, nothing is covered that shall not be revealed, nor hid that shall not be known. That which I tell you in the dark, speak ye in the light. That which you hear in the ear, preach ye upon the housetops. <coughs> fear ye not them that kill the body, but those that are able to kill the soul, but rather fear him that can destroy both soul and body into hell. Preach what I tell you, you preach. He preached the example, he preached about the four uh, types of seed that go on the field. And he didn't explain what it meant. Later on that night, the apostle said, what does it mean? And he said, I will explain to you what it means. The four different types of seed. Four different types of souls. And you, will not, and you will afterwards tell the people what it means. So he told the apostles in secret the meaning of the gospel. And then he commanded them to preach it from the housetops. So he said, I preach in parables that hearing they may not hear and seeing they may not understand. But I'm going to explain to you the meaning of the parables. And I'm going to explain to you what the parables are all about. And then you will explain them from the housetops. This is what the priest must preach from the housetops. Everyone wants to hear about the scandals. Everyone wants to hear about the wickedness. But St. Athanasius would preach the faith and the gospel from the housetops. That's what he did. And this is that which destroys the enemies of God. What is the great demonic attack against Catholic tradition right now? The great demonic attack against Catholic tradition right now is that we are going to preach a three-quarters Catholicism, a seven-eighths Catholicism from the pulpit. And we're going to not preach the whole faith and entire. And we're going to try to be united, like Michael Matt says, have a union of the clans, the union of the Trinity of St. Peter, the union of the good and adult priests saying the new mass, the union of the Society of St. Pius Smith and the independent priests. Let's all be united together so that we can say we are just ordinary Catholics who are fighting against the wickedness of Pope Francis. St. Athanasius did not do that. There were many that said, Athanasius, Arius is really bad. But this other bishop, he's not like Arius. This other bishop is good. This other bishop is conservative. His name is Bishop Schneider, back in the year 400 AD. This man, Bishop of the three. This Bishop Snyder of that time, he's a good bishop. This Bishop Burke of that time, he's a good bishop. Don't be too hard on them. Notice that Athanasius, there is only one truth. Liberius was the first pope not to be canonized because though he believed the truth himself, he was exiled, he was tortured, he was made to say you must compromise the truth and you will do it by smashing Athanasius. And so he did. And he signed a heretical document of Sirmium. Though modern scholars say, maybe he didn't really sign it. Well, yes, he did. 
And there was a second document of Syria, which he also signed, which favors heresy and promotes the heretics. And Liberius did this for what purpose? That he might have peace in the church. Liberius is the first pope to not be a saint, even though he himself was not an Arian. The saint of that time was the man that the pope excommunicated and sent into exile three of the five times he was sent into exile, and that was St. Athanasius. There were some others that stood up at that time, but Athanasius was the one who stood boldly and firmly, and he never wavered, not even a moment or a second or in the smallest way of the truth. He recognized that the Holy Mother Church can only be passed from generation to generation. When we realize, St. Paul says, Fides ex to. The faith comes by hearing, not by the sacred liturgy, not by incense. It comes by hearing. We must hear the word of God. It must drop down into our hearts. It must come out in our actions. But first we must hear. <coughs> Many of you are bad today. <coughs> will be good tomorrow. <coughs> Many good today. will be bad tomorrow. But consider the mystery of those bishops back in the 1500s. Those bishops who condemned Protestantism Many of them were very immoral. They stopped the Council of Trent at one point because there was a bad cook. And they said, we are cardinals. We are running the church. We can't have bad food. And so they excommunicated the cook. And they, 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 they made a better food be brought in because it was very important that they have good food and all cardinals are supposed to be fat. And they were. And the fact is, there were very immoral cardinals amongst them. But those cardinals, some of them extremely immoral, when you touched the faith, those cardinals became as strong as a rock. And they stood upon Athanasius, who was called the pillar of the church. Now, there are 12 pillars of the church, which are the 12 apostles. But something happened in the world to St. Gregory the Great, the Pope, that in the time of Athanasius, the pillars had crumbled. There were no longer 12 pillars holding up the church. And there was one pillar that held up the church, and that was Athanasius. And we look at the 20th century, there was one pillar that held up the church, and that was Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre. And you don't need to know anything about him. Most of us in America can't pronounce his name anyway. A fever, whatever. The fact is, what is it that matters about him? The same as Athanasius. We know St. Athanasius, Athanasius is one of many saints. There are so many saints. You can like him, you can pray to him, but he was just one of many saints. Except for the fact that Athanasius was a saint that got the Catholic Church from the 300 AD to 400 AD. And if there was not Athanasius, the church would have died, and the Catholic faith would have died. He was the pillar of the church that held it during that 4th century. And many saints followed Athanasius. Hilary was one of them. He was also a bishop. Hillary followed Athanasius. Hillary recognized that Athanasius, he is the one who is holding the truth, and I will follow him. But Athanasius is the one who held that truth. And he was supported by St. Anthony of the Desert, the great hermit, who fought the devil hand-to-hand -hand combat in the desert. And St. Anthony, St. Anthony was, a, was the spiritual, supernatural support of Athanasius. The young man who learned what it means to fight the devil from the greatest warrior of all time in hand-to-hand -hand fighting, combat against the devil, St. Anthony of the Desert. And Athanasius, one of his great contributions to our church was to write the life of St. Anthony, the first hermit. And he wrote that life of the great warrior against the devil. And the spirit of St. Anthony entered into Athanasius, and he was the warrior of warriors. And even the later St. Anthony, who was the greatest preacher in the history of the world, who was he named after? Anthony of the Desert. Anthony of Padua was named after Anthony of the Desert. And he had great power because Anthony was the one who fought the devil. And we must fight the devil. And here is, so, so it says, our Lord Jesus Christ says, the servant is not greater than the master. You must teach the word of God, preach the word of God, preach the word of God. And there will be enemies of the word of God in every single age. And it is the divine truth that gets us from one age to another. We can be without Mass, even for a long time. So long as one priest somewhere in the world celebrates the Holy Sacrifice the Mass, how far does the grace go from this altar? 
Does it only go out a few feet? Some man telling me the reason you used to wear a mask is because, after all, when you, when, you, uh, when you blink your eyes, it goes out about eight inches from your uh, face. When you cough, it can go as far as six or eight feet. How far does the grace of the mask go? Does it only reach to the end of the building? Does it only reach to the end of Pottawatomie County? It just crossed the border a little while ago. Does it only reach Pottawatomie County? Does it only reach Kansas? Dorothy left Kansas. It goes everywhere. It goes to the entirety of the world. One mass has grace that goes to the extremities of the universe. It penetrates down to the bottom of hell and crushes the devils. It reaches to the top of heaven and speaks to God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and to the angels and the saints, the Blessed Virgin Mary, and Lord Jesus Christ in the empyrean heaven. It reaches to the entirety of the earth. So for somewhere in there, and one priest somewhere in the world is celebrating the true mass, then the world can continue. In a book about the Antichrist many years ago, Mr. Blue, the last priest, able to celebrate the Mass. And he celebrated the Mass just before the world came to an end, the final Mass. That somehow they took away all the grapes, made it impossible to celebrate Mass because there were no grapes and no possibility of wine. And he was finally able to find that last grape. And he was finally able to make that last wine. And he was able to celebrate that last Mass. And then the world could end. There can be no continuation of the world without the Mass. This is true as the center of our faith, but one Mass is enough for the whole world. And I don't have to be the one celebrating it, and you don't have to be the ones at it. But as regards the faith, we had always better have that faith inside of ourselves. And this faith is that which must be preserved, and we cannot uh, play games with this holy faith. The servant is not greater than the master, says our Lord Jesus Christ. And they call him Beelzebub, and they call him a devil. If they call the master of the, ho the, master of the house Beelzebub, how much or more are they going to call the members of his household? And then in the epistle, St. Paul speaks about it, that we are earthen vessels. Our Lord Jesus Christ is not an earthen vessel. He was a divine vessel. But we are earthen vessels. Earthen vessels are made out of clay. And the old water pots you would carry are made out of clay. If you touch them the wrong way, they break. If you kick them, they break. If you drop them, they break. If you look at them cross the they break. And the fact is that we are earthen vessels. God decided that his divine truth be carried in earthen vessels. But these, even though they are weak vessels that carry this truth, the truth shall be carried from one generation to the next. And look at these earthen vessels. We are made of clay. The priest is made of clay, and the Catholic is made of clay. Not just the priest, but every baptized soul, all the way up to the Pope. We are made of clay. This clay had better not have any holes in it. Because if it has any holes, the water of faith will leak out. It shall go out, and we shall not be able to hold the faith. We are very fragile, but we must hold that faith inside of us. And remember, in the great last battle... What must be carried into battle? Yes, we must carry the faith into battle. But Gideon is the great example of the priest of the final age. And what is it that he carries into battle? Three weapons. It is the weapon of the trumpet by which he blows the horn in the night and terrifies the enemies of God and condemns sin and wickedness and heresy. The light by which he enlightens the night so that all those that want to live will follow behind his light and those that do not shall be terrorized and driven away by it. And an earthen vessel, an earthen vessel. God has willed that those of us who carry the faith, the priests, of course, most important, the Pope, Bishop, and priests, but also the faithful, we are our earthen vessels. We are very fragile. And therefore, what does Christ say to us? Do not fear him who can harm your fragile vessel. What is the attack being used by the devil right now? The devil is using an attack on our faith. You must be safe. You must be safe. You must be safe. What must be safe? Our bodies. Lady again on the plane behind me. She says, I can't believe this. We're not social distancing. But on all my other planes we work, we've had nine people on the plane. This last plane flying here, we had about 60, 70 people. I was really feeling crowded. In the airport, I actually see people in the airport. I think, wow, it's getting crowded. I like it when there's only one of us. You know, but I'm glad to get in line to get my cup of coffee. Uh, last two weeks ago, I woke up the Starbucks guy to get my cup of coffee. 
I had to wake him up and said, you only one here? He says, no, there's another one sleeping on the floor back there. There were two of them. But one of them only had to wake up and wanted to give me the cup of coffee. Now there's a line. It stinks. But the fact is, so that what is happening, they are both, why are we have to be socially distant? Why do we have to step aside? Because we have to be safe. The so, lady, you want to be safe, step six feet to the right. That's the way. It's nice and safe out there. You get six feet, you get a nice breeze, and we'll strap you to the wing. If you're still alive, we get to the destination. Okay, if not, well, we can always bury you somewhere else. We'll have to make sure we can't touch the body because that wouldn't be safe. But we'll get a backhoe and scrape your body off the plane and stick you in the ground. We've got to be safe. And so the fact is, they're considering this foolishness. Now, safety is the weapon of the devil for the last 2,000 years, not just today. Saint Anthony, Saint, Saint, or Solomon says, there is nothing new under the sun. Why must we get rid of Christianity, said Emperor Nero? Because these people are unsafe. They are unsanitary. They are cannibals. This is one of the early attacks against the church. Because remember, this is the religion that their creator, their, their founder said, you must eat my flesh and you must drink my blood. That's what they said. And these are the people that eat human flesh and drink human blood. They have to be eradicated from the earth. St. Justin Martyr stood up in front of the emperor and said, yes, we do eat flesh. We do drink blood. But it is the flesh of God made man and his blood that we drink in an unbloody manner in the holy sacrifice of the mass. He said those words in the year 100 AD that every single Catholic knew we must eat the flesh and drink the blood. And it scandalized those that stood around him because that's unsanitary, because that's, in, that's inhumane, that is unsafe, that is bad practice. One, one, one Eastern priest pointed out when they're giving out Holy Communion, remember we give out Holy Communion only under the one species, they take a spoon. And they dip it into the precious blood. And the spoon touches thousands of tongues. And they never clean it. That the spoon touches thousands of tongues. Not one person ever gets sick. Ever. Because there's a safety of the soul that is far more important and greater than the safety of the body. And the fact is, Athanasius recognized this importance and we have reading here from our Lord that they're going to call you males well. Preach in the housetops the truth. Condemn the errors and the heresies. And sometimes it's necessary to condemn the wicked ones, as St. John Chrysostom did of the Empress Eudora. And we must do against Hillary and, and other wicked individuals of today, including our wicked Pope, who must convert and repent. But then also in the epistle, St. Paul says, Brethren, we preach not ourselves, but Jesus Christ our Lord, and our and ourselves, your servants through Jesus. For God who commanded us, commanded the light to shine out in the darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. So the fathers tell us the light shines in the hearts. That's why they used to say in the old, sometimes you see in the old days that our mind sits inside of the heart. From this word of Saint Paul. The light shines from our hearts, says St. Paul. The light goes into the head in secret. It is a dark place. The light comes down to the heart. And the heart is that which pushes us. As St. Paul says, Caritas Christi urgetnos. The chariot of Christ pushes us. The chariot of Christ moves us on. And so it drops down to the heart. And then the heart is where the flashlight is. The heart is where the light shines. It shines out from the heart. And so that there must be, so the light goes into the mind, where we learn in our, in our seminaries, we learn in front of the tabernacle, we learn in the holy bravery, we learn by hearing the word of God preached by the fathers who came before us, we stand upon their shoulders, but then what must happen? It must shine in our hearts. Shine out of the, the, the who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ Jesus. <clears throat> but we have this treasure in earthen vessels, says St. Paul. Here he brings up the earthen vessels. That the excellency may be of the, the power of God and not of us. Why does God allow that there be weak priests? 
Why does he allow there to be Judas Iscariot in the church? Why does he allow Simon Peter to curse and to swear? Why does he, why does he allow us, the priests, to misunderstand things? Why does he allow weakness in his church? So that the glory of the church is the power of God and not of us. It is not the power of Archbishop of Fed, not the power of St. Athanasius, not the power of St. Thomas Aquinas. It is the power of God shining through Athanasius, Thomas Aquinas, and all, and all those who keep the Catholic faith. It's supposed to shine through us. It's supposed to shine through all of us. We oftentimes say, well, I'm not called to be a saint. Oh, yes, I am called to be a saint. For I have two options. Either I shall be a saint worshiping God face to face, or I shall be with the devils. And I don't want to be with the devils. Therefore, I must strive to be and must become a saint. The light of Christ must shine in me. I must shine forth the light of Christ. Athanasius is no longer on this earth. He no longer walks this earth. And St. Pius X no longer walks this earth. His, his, his uh, follower is now Pope Francis. And Francis is not doing what St. Pius X did. And the modern bishops are not doing what Athanasius did. And therefore, there is a crumbling around our church. There is a crumbling around the world. It is not a crumbling because there are a few masses. Look at the year 2020. There are more Latin masses in the world than there was 40 years ago. In 1970, in 1980, in 1990, in the year 2000, there were much less Latin masses in the world than today. There were much less people attending the Latin Mass than today. There were much less people uh, behaving more moral than today. Now, there are, even though there are many more wicked people, there are also more people who are going to the Latin Mass. Percentage-wise, it may not be more, but absolutely-wise, it certainly is. And so that there are more people. Why isn't the world better? Why isn't the church better? Because the number of people at Mass, the number of girls with veils on at the church, the number of girls with dresses in the church, the number of boys that are, that are serving Mass beautifully, and the number of priests that are saying the Latin Mass and reading the old books and reading something out of the old book to the pulpit is not enough to stop Satan. It is not enough to win the battle against Satan. What is necessary to win the battle of Satan? The faith must enter our minds and fall down into our hearts and shine forth from our hearts. And there must not be a compromise of the faith. The fact is that the adult communities are not with God. They are not with God. Many individuals there are going to save their souls. God bless them. But they are not with God because they are not holding the Catholic truth. They are not condemning unequivocally the heresies of our time. The new Mass is offensive to God. It is a blasphemy. We cannot say that it's just not as good as the old Mass. And we cannot, we cannot accept the approval of modernists in a modernist situation. We don't accept to work alongside the modernists in their modernist church. We fight against them and we strive that the church be brought back to its light. As Athanasius did. He sent priests into other dioceses without permission. And they said mass without permission against the bishops. Remember the bishop is the pope of the diocese. The bishop has authority from God himself. Direct authority from God. So the bishop of Kansas City, Kansas has direct authority from God. The pope only delegates this region to him. And that he is the representative of the apostles. And therefore, it is not a small thing to stand up against him. But because he is not doing what God wants him to do, he is not teaching the truth that God wants him to teach, and he is celebrating a Mass and guiding others to that Mass, which is offensive and displeasing to God, and a blasphemy before God, we must stand up against him. Has it changed? No, it hasn't. Now, there are more Latin Masses all over the place. But this is not at all the truth. And Athanasius stood up and said, and we, we must have the faith. They can have the churches. Many times Athanasius was not able to celebrate Mass himself. Wandering through the desert. Being stored in a well. Having to go from place to place. Having no chalice. Having no vestments. Having no way to celebrate the Mass. But he was always bishop. He was always the weapon and the armor of God against the enemies of God. He held up the banner of the divine truth. 
He allowed himself to be banished by the Pope three different times. To be banished by the king and by others three different times. At least five different times altogether. And he stood for the truth no matter what. And what is necessary in every age is that we stand for the truth no matter what. And this is what's missing in our times. Completely missing in our times. We cannot... <clears throat> And that we must pray that there be the continuation of the spirit and fight of St. Athanasius in our times. He must continue. It must continue. And so, there, so then the... So that we... But we, but we are... In all things we suffer, perse we suffer tribulation. Here is St. Paul is speaking to the Apostle. And this is the instruction that is given to each priest of God. If you follow God, you must experience these things that St. Paul speaks about. In all things, we suffer tribulation, but we are not distressed. This is one of the great tragedies. When you go into army, when you go into war, and the general says, Charge. <laughs> you don't want to follow that general. Charge over there. I'm going to go back and check on the plans. That's not a general to follow. We are in tribulation, but we are not distressed. Here is what our St. Paul is instructing St. Timothy. He's instructing his other bishops. He's instructing Titus. He's instructing all of them. What are the priests and bishops of the church to do? They are always going to suffer tribulation, but we are not distressed. We are straightened. That is attacked on every side. And to everything trying to rip away, but we are not destitute. We suffer persecution. But we are not forsaken. We are cast down, but we perish not. Always bearing about in our body the mortification of Jesus, which means St. Paul may have had the stigmata, mortification of Jesus, that the life also of Jesus may be made manifest in our bodies. We have to manifest Christ in our bodies. Hence we find down the last 2,000 years, what do we have in the Holy Roman Catholic Church? Always martyrs. In every age, there have been martyrs. In every age, there have been Catholics killed for their holy faith. They have manifested the faith in their bodies. And we also say in our apologetics classes, how do we know the twelve apostles were definitely speaking the truth? Because no man dies for a lie. And all twelve of them, including St. John, who miraculously was preserved, died for the faith. They died for the faith. Rather than to say that they did not witness the resurrection which they did witness, that they were not carriers of the true kingdom of God, they were carriers of the true kingdom of God, they did witness the resurrection, it was a real and physical resurrection, because our church, the Holy Roman Catholic Church, is different from every other church because our church is physical. Holiness is not spiritual pie in the sky, the priest is called holy. And why am I called holy? Because my body was sanctified by the bishop when I was ordained a priest. And I wear holy vestments made out of cloth, made out of real material. I genuflect and do holy ceremonies and hold the host, holy host inside between my thumb and my forefinger and preach the holy word of God contained in sacred scripture, which is written in a book to your souls. And preach the sacred tradition, which is now written down by the fathers of the church and in our magisterium to your souls. And preach those things that I have heard in my ear by the old priest that trained me. The old priests that I was raised around, they spoke the truth in the, and it was heard into my ear physically and it comes out of my mouth now. It is a physical church. We are not a spiritual church. We are not an invisible church. We are a physical church. It is in our bodies. The earthen vessels that we have, that we have must carry the divine truth and the divine faith. And therefore, the physicality of our church is most real. And it must be spread from generation unto generation. We carry this faith in earthen vessels, says St. Paul. Always bearing about in our body the mortification of Jesus. For we who live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake. That the life also of Jesus may be made manifest in our mortal flesh. We who live are always delivered unto death. That's the truth of the matter. If we live in God, the world will always hate us. It's not just the modern world that hates the Catholics. Every generation has hated them. Every generation. It is not just modern weak souls in the church that hate those that are breaking the faith. They have always been hated. 
And there must be a always exposed to death, whether it be physical death in the case of the martyrs, the death of our jobs, the death of our names, the death of all the things that we have being separated from us. We are always exposed to death, but we do not perish. We are cast down, but we come back up. God preserves the church in every single generation. He'll preserve this generation. This generation is one in which the devil is about to surround our church and surround all those that have a true faith and wipe them out. But before this wiping out takes place, the Blessed Virgin Mary will have her great victory. Athanasius is still the answer to the crisis in the church. Our sister Lefebvre, who is the Athanasius of the 20th century, is still the answer to the crisis of the church. St. Bernard of Clairvaux is still the answer of the, of the crisis of the church. And every single saint who has stood for the faith, St. Gregory the Great, St. Gregory the Seventh, St. Gregory the Seventh, who stood against the entire church to hold it up against great corruption and heresy in the 1100s. He stood strong to hold the church on his own back. Had to be die, had to die in exile, and he was the Pope in a quote unquote Catholic age. But he held the church and carried it from the ten hundreds to the twelve hundreds. And so it must be that in every age there must be the carrying of the church and there must be the holding of the faith with persecution. That's why there is a sacrament of confirmation. You give the slap upon the cheek to remind that there shall be some kind of persecution. So therefore we have a great respect and a great honor and a great love and a great gratitude for Athanasius, the great saint who kept the faith for us. We stand upon their shoulders, says St. Bernard. We stand upon Athanasius' shoulders. We stand upon Augustine's shoulders. And we see far because we stand upon great shoulders. And we must stand upon the shoulders of our ancestors and never look in another direction than the one that they looked in. And do not fear those who can slay the body, but only those who can slay the soul. And don't look for some kind of false and ignorant and foolish compromise by which we're going to be together in behavior, together in morals, together because we are against the same enemies in this world. Enemies that shall be forgotten. Paul VI is already forgotten. Francis will soon be forgotten. John Paul II is already forgotten. And all those that have not stood for the truth, they are forgotten. We don't want to stand up against them. We stand up against principalities and powers. We stand up against heresy. We stand up against sin. And this must be stood up against in every age. And we stand firm on the saints that we are following, our ancestors in the last 2,000 years. And we must carry the faith from this generation on into the next. We must carry it and not let go of it. This is what is most necessary, and therefore it is not enough to have a liturgy, not enough to be conservative. We must be, and by the grace of God, and in the intercession of St. Athanasius, we must always be Catholic. We will God bless you all, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.